It is not uncommon in works of fiction for characters to be named something that is reflective of their personalities or occupations or dramatic arc. So Max Danger comes to mind, or Maverick, or Neo from The Matrix. Dr. Evil, if you remember him, that's a spoof on this concept. It is so common in fiction that it may seem strange to think that it happens in the real world too. So think of Francine Prose, the novelist, or Jules Engst, the psychiatrist who specializes in anxiety disorders. At Something's Happening Here, we firmly believe that names carry a spiritual power, and on today's show, we aim to demonstrate why, with a combination of history and prophecy. So be careful what names you assign to things, because you may just be prophesying the future of that thing. Does that sound crazy? We'll see. Welcome to today's show called Roman Roll Call. All right, friends, welcome back. Today is Tuesday, and we are continuing our discussion of the importance and spiritual power of names, uh, which is our theme for the whole week. Yesterday, we looked at the new COVID subvariant and the name that was given to it, and we hope that's a false name because I don't want any more COVID-related chaos or strife, as is implied by the name Eris. Today, we're, we're shifting focus a little bit and going back in time. We're, we're approaching this topic from a position of history today, and we're going to travel backwards in time about 2,000 years, actually a little more than 2,000 years, um, or I guess at the, the start of this mythology be quite a bit longer than 2,000 years ago, but it's a long time ago. We are going to ancient Rome. This is one of my favorite illustrations of the powers of name. So join me in Wikipedia. That's going to be our our starting point for today. In Wikipedia, we look at this article on Mars, the uh, parenthetical mythology. So not the planet, but the mythology of that name Mars. And we learn right away, in ancient Roman religion and myth, Mars was the god of war and also an agricultural guardian, a combination characteristic of early Rome. He was the son of Jupiter and Juno, and was preeminent among the Roman army's military gods. Of course, he's the god of war. <laughs> so why are we talking about Mars? Because our second article, also from Wikipedia, is about Romulus, who was a son of Mars. Let's read about Romulus. Romulus was the legendary founder and first king of Rome. In fact, that is from which the name Rome comes. Uh, Romulus, I believe, translates to citizen of Rome. So really, Romulus and Rome are interchangeable like that. Uh, various traditions attribute the establishment of many of Rome's oldest legal, political, religious, and social institutions to Romulus and his contemporaries. Um, and the, the boundary between mythology and history is not a clear-cut boundary here. Um, Apparently, historians generally believe there was a real person named Romulus and real things that that person did. But it's certainly unverifiable to think that he was impregnated by a god, right? So it's up to you to decide, I guess, what you believe is true and what you believe is myth. But Romulus had a brother named Remus. And let's go ahead and read about them. According to Roman mythology... Romulus and Remus were the sons of Rhea Silvia by the god Mars. Mars also had other baby mamas as well, <laughs> apparently. And goes on to the family tree there. We get a little bit of insight as to the violence in this family tree in the paragraph right underneath that. Before the twins' birth, Numitor's throne had been usurped by his brother Em Emulius who murdered Numitor's son or sons and condemned Rhea Silvia to perpetual virginity by consecrating her as a vestal. When Rhea became pregnant, she asserted that she had been visited by the god Mars. And so this is, this goes on. This is, this kind of infidelity is why Romulus and Remus were supposed to be thrown to their deaths into the river, but then something happened where they were not thrown in and then they were found by a wolf who became their kind of surrogate mother. The story goes on and on and on. But they are the sons of Mars. 
And Rome is named after Romulus, which means Rome is quite literally the city of, the son of, the god of war. Rome itself is descended from warfare. Why is that relevant? Well, cause, right, because Rome is just about like the most violent place in the world <laughs> and always has been. And so here, our next article is uh, from Sightseeing Tours Italy. The website is romecitytour.it. And uh, we're going to read about the gruesome history of Rome. That's the name of this article. It's really just a blog. It's designed to attract attention for tourists, but it's it's got something to say here. Rome was built on violence. It says Rome's very beginnings are rumored to have centered around violence, according to the legend of the rape of the Sabian women. And goodness gracious, I didn't even go into the that story from the previous article, but there was a whole like uh, massive rape by deception thing that is built into this mythology. <clears throat> when Romulus first founded Rome in the 8th century BC, he had many followers, but most of them were men. They needed women to increase their population, and so they approached the Sabians and asked to take some of their women for wives. When the Sabian men refused, the Romans knew that they had to take what they wanted by force. Romulus, as an act of friendship, <laughs> staged a chariot race. While the races distracted the Sabian men, Romulus's followers abducted many of the women. <laughs> and now there's a little coda here just to help us feel better about this terrible story says, according to some historians, no actual sexual assault took place. But even so, this is one gruesome way to forge an empire. And honestly, I don't even know how that could possibly be true. How can there be no sexual assault when they take these people by force and apparently reproduce with them? <laughs> Did, I, I don't know. None of that makes sense. That th This story is a foundation of violence, sexual violence and physical violence. But what about as time goes on, right, beyond the kind of mythical beginnings, what about real life on the ground Rome? Well, the article continues. Violence as entertainment. Probably, it says, the most famous aspect of Rome's gruesome history are the events that took place in the Circus Maximus and later in the Colosseum. Emperors built these grand stadiums to entertain the masses and keep them happy, and the most popular forms of entertainment were undeniably gory. Chariot races were one of the most popular forms of entertainment in Roman times, but they were notoriously dangerous, which added to the excitement for the crowds. Gladiatorial battles were also a big draw for audiences. Thousands of spectators would pile into the stadiums to catch a glimpse of two gladiators compete in an epic, violent battle that normally ended in death. And before I continue, um, you understand that's ultimate fighting. <laughs> Like we have civilized this practice so that most of the time that does not actually end in death, but it's the same idea. I mean, these are two athletic gladiators who face each other with extreme violence for the entertainment of everybody watching. Now, we haven't really progressed all that far in the last couple thousand years. The article continues saying Romans also involved animals in the brutality, with exotic animals such as lions, tigers, and elephants being brought into the amphitheater to either face each other or a human competitor. Uh, and of course, when I visited Mexico 20 years ago, I watched a bullfight. And so that, that same thing happens there, right? A man versus a bull <laughs> while everybody watches and cheers. So this was just every day in Rome. They they looked at violence as a form of entertainment. And I'm not going to disclose where I live now, because I'd like to keep at least a sense of privacy to myself. But as I've learned the history of my new area, I've, I've discovered that um, the people in the past here also loved themselves a good hanging. And so they, they, they viewed violence as a form of entertainment, too. Maybe it's just the human condition. All right, so what are we learning here? We are learning that, of course, Rome had to be this way. It's the city of the son of the god of war. So violence, of course, permeates everything, like it's in the very blood of the society. And even scripture agrees with that. So 
when we open up our Bibles to the book of Daniel, in the Old Testament, um, chapter 7, right here, so, you know, a little more than halfway through your book, chapter 7, verse 7, is um, when you study it out, we, we come to the conclusion that we are describing the uh, empire of Rome in this verse. When you tune in tomorrow, we're going to go through exactly how we reach that conclusion. For today, just take my word for it. But the description of Rome is the following in verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, that one's Rome, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So this is how God views that empire. He views it with the same violence that our own historians view it with. It could not be any other way. The name itself demands it. Now, to conclude, this is ancient history, right? And I believe that the reason this ancient history is true is probably when we kind of bring theology into it, it's probably because Mars, whatever figure that was was the real life Mars or its predecessor in the Greek empire, I think it was Ares, but that figure that inspired Ares and then Mars was probably a demon. That's my guess, right? So it's not just like make-believe, like someone pulled it out of thin air. It was probably a superhuman character that was superhuman because he wasn't really human. And that's why it takes on the kind of god-like status, because from their perspectives, a demon would have been a god. Ay, 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 ay. And even today, we still operate with this mentality. Don't believe me? Here's our last article for today. It comes from Fox News. The, the headline is, A bigot and a racist! Democrat pushes to strip lawmaker's name from Senate building. And the details are, from, from the body of the article, Representative Al Green, a Democrat from Texas, introduced a resolution on Friday, and the date on this article is August 22, so um, very, very recent. Uh, resolution on Friday calling on Congress's upper chamber, the Senate, to wipe the name of the late Senator Richard Russell off the Russell Senate office building. The Georgia Democrat, Mr. Russell, was a staunch opponent of desegregation and the civil rights movement, movement during his nearly four decades in the Senate. So this man is dead. He has no influence on the goings on of the Senate or the government broadly. He's just a name at this point. Like his body is cold and decomposed at this point. Why are we in such a hurry to get his name off of the building? Right? The, the government the Senate, these things don't operate according to his ideas anymore. Why is it such a big deal? Ah, oh, it's because when we see a name associated with something, the larger context of that name becomes associated with the thing too. And so we can say all day long, oh, the Senate is not a racist body. It does not uphold racism. It, it is in favor of the civil rights movement and in favor of desegregation, all these stuff. But as long as this dude's name is on the building, it never can feel like we actually get there. Do you see the problem? We still operate according to this idea that a name carries with it power. So as long as that name is on the Senate building, we can never truly be free of racism. This is not just ancient paganism, guys. This is modern paganism. <laughs> And so it's a real thing that's happening in the world around us. Uh, that's that's going to be it for us today. Um, let's pray about this. And I really want you to come back tomorrow. Today was just a setup for tomorrow where we're going to study the Bible in some, some detail. Let's pray. Father, help us to realize that this is not just make-believe and it's not just a game. That you have endowed names with a certain power. And we need to take that seriously in these last days. Free us from the bonds of paganism, Lord. 
and bring us into your truth and your gospel always, where we cannot be afraid of that which carries no, no real power. And we will only have proper biblical fear towards you. Forgive our sins, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, again, I really want you to come back tomorrow. It's very important. Don't miss tomorrow's show. So if you're on Facebook, that means you go to the Steve Hicks page and you like it, which makes you a follower of it. If you're on YouTube, uh, go to the Talking Donkey International's channel and subscribe to it and hit your notification bell. If you don't like any of these social media, you can just go to talkingdonkeyinternational.org slash podcast and you'll get an entire archive there. Or you can go to Rumble, love Rumble, and uh, find our channel there. You can hit the follow button. And my personal favorite, somethingshappeninghere.locals.com. Uh, we'll, it's a free community and we want you there. But if you don't want to just have the free community, you can become a paid supporter and have access to the paywalled stuff uh, that I produce there every week, and which is not published anywhere else. So I really want you on Locals. But more than that, I want you back here tomorrow on whatever platform you're watching this. May God bless you and come tomorrow with your Bibles and your prophecy hats. God bless. <laughs>